Well, it is a delight to be here with such distinguished colleagues, um, Congressman John Lewis, uh, not only a civil rights icon, but a leader and a moral conscience for all of us here in the Congress. Thank you, John. Um, Congresswoman Ileana Ross uh, Lathan, she is, a, 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 again, someone who always works on a bipartisan basis, makes a difference on every issue, and uh, is a real beacon of truth and determination to fight for every person. Um, Mary Keene is here with her daughter, Ani, from New York. Um, Philip McAdoo, yeah. McAdoo um, and Sean Cavanaugh and their son, Zayden, from Atlanta, and Martin Gill and his sons from Miami. Are both your Martin's sons? Just, or just one, one today. And what's your name? Nathaniel. Nathaniel's here. Well, I am very proud to stand with my colleagues today to announce the reintroduction of the Every Child Deserves a Family Act. This legislation would open more loving homes to children by ending discrimination against adoptive and foster parents based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status, or the sexual orientation or gender identity of the child involved. Nationwide, there are an estimated 400,000 children in the U.S. foster care system and more than 104,000 children currently waiting to be adopted including 6,400 just in New York State alone. While New York is a leader on ensuring that any family can adopt children and sets a great example for the rest of the country, LGBT couples or individuals who want to adopt or become foster parents still face discrimination in more than 35 states. By removing all barriers for LGBT families to serve as foster parents, New York has dramatically increased its foster and adoptive parent pool. Currently, 39 states have barriers restricting the ability of LGBT people and same-sex couples to adopt children, and more than two dozen remain silent on the issue. Only 19 states and the District of Columbia permit same-sex couples to jointly adopt, and six states explicitly ban discrimination based on sexual orientation in foster care. This includes California, Massachusetts, New, Jer New Jersey, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin. This patchwork of state laws leave, often leave our children across the country without the opportunity for a safe home and loving parents. Meanwhile, there's an untapped pool of two million LGBT people, people who are willing to become adoptive or foster parents, according to the Williams Institute at UCLA. The Every Child Deserves a Family Act would allow these families to become adoptive or foster parents by prohibiting an entity that receives federal assistance and is involved in adoption or foster care placements from discriminating against prospective parents or foster parents solely on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. Congress annually invests more than $8 billion into the child welfare system, and many of these children could be adopted by LGBT families or single parents if the bans in local jurisdictions were removed. This legislation is about finding solid, permanent, and loving homes for foster children waiting to be adopted. It's time to put the best interests of our children first and remove all discriminatory barriers in our child welfare system. I'd now like to introduce my dear friend and Congressman John Lewis, who continues to be a stalwart voice for justice for all Americans. Thank you. Senator Gillibrand, I'm delighted to stand with you and Representative Rose Leverton today as lead house sponsor for the Irish Child Reserve of Family Act of 2013. I fought too long and too hard against discrimination of every kind not to serve as a champion for this bill. Foster children are innocent bystanders when troubled families crash and burn. The foster care system does its best to rescue these little babies from the flames of abuse, neglect, drug addiction, domestic violence, and some of society's worst problems. This legislation today is saying that we can do better, that we can do much better. And we will pass this legislation, and when it is signed into law, we will turn a page. 
But too often these children are victim twice, first by their own families and then again by the extended stay in a system that is meant to be temporary. The Ben H approach can never heal the wounds or their suffering like the hands and hearts of loving parents committed to their happiness. If Congress passes this bill, we will have a great opportunity, the chance to erase the human challenge of foster care adoption, or at least reduce it as a major social concern. In these days of so much strife, war, economic crisis, terrorism, endless violence, and countless other abuse, it is refreshing. It is very refreshing to even consider that we might be able to solve just one human problem. We must not allow rigid thinking to rob our society of that kind of meaningful opportunity. Are we so heartless that we would demand children grow up in group homes rather than be adopted by loving, effective single parents or cable willing same-sex couple? We're fooling ourselves if we believe that is the right thing to do. This little bill that these two members of Congress, a senator, a House member, the senator then requires to get a passport, uh, a visa to come over <laughs> and hold this press conference on the Senate side. But if we can come over and hold a press conference to House members on the Senate side, then in a bipartisan fashion, we can pass this bill. And I'm convinced that we will. This bill requires every adoption agent receiving federal money to put the welfare of children first. It rule out discriminatory practices in adoption of children who need families, including LGBT children who too often end up as runaways or homeless. Let's do it. Let's pass the bill and see if we can end the problem of foster adoption forever. We can do it, and we must do it on our own watch. Thank you very much. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing Congresswoman Ileana Ross Leighton, uh, a stalwart and an unbelievably strong leader that is going to be the leader in the House uh, on the Republican side to help us get this done. Ileana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. I have to be extra nice to her because not only is she a terrific legislator, she's also the captain of our congressional uh, softball team. And if I don't do a good job, I'm not that good of a player. I could get bounced out at any time. Thanks so much for having me follow John Lewis. All right. Yeah, that's that's really great. Thank you, Kristen. We we all follow John Lewis. Oh, very good. Well, uh, Kristen and John and ladies and gentlemen, Martin right here uh, behind me. Martin is the type of man who was always destined to be a great dad. After fostering several children, Martin and his partner Bruce filed a petition for adoption with the Florida Circuit Court to adopt their two foster children, Nathaniel and, and Xavier. Uh, Nathaniel is here with us. An action that was prohibited by a 1977 Ford, Florida law that bans gays and lesbians from adopting. Martin and Bruce finally were granted custody of their sons, effectively nullifying the Florida anti-gay adoption statute and making it unenforceable. The story of this family ended happily, but Martin's struggle is sadly far from unique. Currently, as we had heard the statistics from the previous speakers, 39 states have barriers restricting the ability of LGBT individuals and same-sex uh, couples <laughs> to adopt children. One in three child welfare agencies in the United States reject, uh, reject gay, lesbians, and bisexual applicants. That is a heartbreaking reality, not only for so many qualified potential parents, like the ones we see here today, but more so for the children in the foster care system who are denied the chance to be raised by loving parents in a stable and safe environment. 
The single biggest problem in our nation's uh, foster care system is facing a lack of qualified foster homes. The individual state adoption laws and policies are adding to the problem by denying vulnerable children access to permanent homes by discriminating against uh, devoted, committed parents based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. Over 100,000 American children are available for adoption right now, but 26,000 of them age out of the foster care system each year before they can find a permanent family. Research has shown that these young individuals are at a heightened risk of poverty, of homelessness, incarceration, and early parenthood. May is National Foster Care Awareness Month, and there's no better time for us to act on this important issue and give thousands of young individuals the chance for a better life. I intend to do my part. I'm proud to introduce the Every Child Deserves a Family Act together with Congressman John Lewis, and you know if John Lewis is carrying the bill, you know it's the right thing to do. And the same can be said for Senator Kristen Gillibrand. Our bill will decrease the length of time that a child has to wait for permanency with an affectionate family by preventing discrimination, adoption, and foster care placements based on sexual identity, orientation, or marital status, or gender identity. The old argument that the welfare of the child is dependent upon having two parents of different genders has been disproven in study after study. Children raised by gay and lesbian parents and same-sex couples have the same advantages and expectations for health, social, and psychological adjustment and development as children raised by parents who are heterosexual. Major organizations in the field of child welfare, medicine, psychology, law have repeatedly taken official positions in support of allowing qualified LGBT and unmarried couples to foster and adopt. The time for passage of this bill is ripe, with 64% of Americans viewing a same-sex couple with children as a family, up from 10% just a few years ago. Every Child Deserves a Family Act is not only a common sense bill that will improve the lives of some of the most vulnerable and exposed children in our nation, but it also makes fiscal sense. Many states are currently suffering under mountains of debt, and the cost of fostering children and forcing them, rather, to remain in foster care, these costs are ever increasing. A grave injustice is being done to these good people and to the thousands of innocent children who want nothing more than to find an, a permanent home with a devoted family, regardless of their new parents' sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. Without this legislation, many families who are longing to provide kids with a loving home will continue to be arbitrarily turned away on the subjective and prejudicial basis of some identity that is not proven by any study to have any factor whatsoever for the happiness of the child. So I urge every member to get this behind this bill and to help us get this common sense and fiscally sound legislation through the process. Thank you, uh, Kristen, and thank you, John, and thank you, Martin and Nathaniel and all the loving families who are here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. Thank you, Liana. I'm now honored to introduce Mary Keene from New York uh, and her daughter, Ani, to speak. At age 50, Mary a retired, as, retired as a health care consultant and used her savings to buy a 12-bedroom house in Yonkers, originally intending to make it a house of safe haven for LGBT teens who'd been rejected by their families. Instead, Mary became a foster mother to adolescents with nowhere else to go. Mary has since provided a stable, loving home for more than 20 foster children. Mary. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor to be here and to have this bill sponsored and to be in the company of um, these illustrious folks and everyone here. Particularly being with Representative John Lewis is just mind-boggling to me, so um, I'll have to speak to him later. But when I first thought about doing this, um, I really, I hesitated for many years. I wanted to be a parent. I never wanted to have little kids. I don't really do little kids. But um, I hesitated because I was afraid as an out lesbian, and I was not going to do it on any other terms, that I would be rejected, that the system would reject me, and then maybe the kids would reject me. But luckily, I live in the New York City metropolitan area. And so that was not an issue. In fact, it became 
um, someone's master's thesis when they did my home study and stuff. So they were all excited about my going through the process and everything. And so then they certified me. And I was still unsure about the kids. And actually in New York City, believe it or not, I was, I was looking for LGBT kids. And they told me, well, we don't have any right now. Would you take straight kids? So I said, well, OK. Um, I guess it's not their fault. So <laughs> let me, OK, it's a mixed world. We all have to learn to get along. So OK, so 13 years ago, February 16th, um, this little 14-year-old girl was brought to my house. And that began my process of growing and learning about what this was all about. Um, many of my kids. Uh, they never, never cared about my sexual orientation. It was about as irrelevant as you could possibly get. And having parented for 13 years now, what I've found is that, if anything, they learned a lot. Um, some of my kids have won, uh, written award-winning essays about marriage equality and why gays should be allowed to marry. One of my daughters wrote for uh, Youth Magazine, said, I have the best foster mom, and she's gay. Luckily, I was out, so it was OK. But, um, <laughs> It, it's just, it was, it was really a learning experience for them. It was a non-issue. Um, and not only was it a non-issue for them, ultimately, of course, they had children, which is not what I originally planned either. But there are a lot of grandchildren right now. And I realize every day, every single day, my children, who are now from 23 to 42, every day they remind me how much they need a parent. They haven't stopped needing a parent because they're older. They need it more now than they did when they were young. Because when they were young, they had no idea that they need a parent. If any of you have teenagers, you know they don't think they need anything, right? Um, just give them a cell phone, give them some money, blah, 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 and they got it all together. So my kids now um, are much more aware. And so they remind me, and not only do they remind me, my grandchildren remind me. And my grandchildren are from... Um, Who's the youngest? God, I lose track. But anyway, one, one is under a year old um, and up to 15. And most of them, except for the 15-year-old, have never known life without a grandma. And that's who I am to them. And it has nothing to do with my sexual orientation. They know about it. They, they embrace it. Again, they're much more, they do all sorts of causes in their school, advocating and you know carrying on about, no, it's not right that people are discriminated against and stuff like that. And so they have all of that. But it's just grandma. And this bill will allow more kids to have a grandma, to have a mom, their whole life, because it never ends. It never ends. My friend's mother just died at 99 years old. You know she's devastated. It doesn't end, your need for a parent. And that's what we're looking for. I ultimately figured out I couldn't do this all by myself, so I joined an organization, you got to believe. And with that, I work with a lot of older youth. And every youth I speak to, I ask them, do you care about the sexual orientation of somebody that's going to be your parent? And without question, every child says, I don't care. I just need to be loved. That's all that I want. Mm -hmm. So not only one thing I am going to get in trouble for, my nine-year-old granddaughter wanted to come. One of them wanted to come. She finds out that there were little kids here. I am in such trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody can tell her, OK? Her mother told her. Her mother wanted to come, but she, had, she couldn't miss school, um, college, because of her final exams. And um, so the daughter said she wanted to come. And her mother said, no, you can't miss school either, because she was just jealous, I think. But um, <laughs> we, just this is so important. Every child does deserve a family. And you just got to believe that this is possible and it's going to pass. So thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, you, me? Do you want to introduce uh, Philip? Oh, oh, Ani's going to speak. Oh, Ani's going to speak. Ani, sorry. I blew this. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm so proud to introduce um, one of my babies, <laughs> who was a baby. She wasn't a baby. She was 17 when she came to me. Mm -hmm. but, um, and she was adopted at 24. Mm -hmm. But I told her not to say anything that's going to make me cry. So I'm going to proudly introduce my daughter, <laughs> Ani. Ani Keen, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say quick words because my mom already, you know, she already said everything. Um, and thank mm -hmm. God she decided to be a parent for me because... Because she stepped forward, I have a mom. And my daughter had the grandmother. Thank you. 
Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you a two people from my district, two beautiful, handsome, wonderful people. Phil McAdoo is a doctoral student at the University of Pennsylvania and an educational coach and advocate for Family First. His partner, Sean Kozma, is a physician and medical officer for the Center for Disease Control, better known as CDC. <laughs> I visit many, many times. They waited almost two years after satisfying all the requirements to adopt a child. And finally, they were able to welcome their son, Zayn, into their family. Beautiful little boy. They're here today to tell us their story and why they believe this legislation is important. Philip Mikadu and his seven-year-old son, Zayn, welcome. Thank you very much. Can you see? Yeah? All right. So about uh, a year ago in February, I was sitting at my desk, and I got an email from our adoption agency that said, do you want this child? My partner, like he is now, was in Africa, and so before I could catch up with him, I said yes, <laughs> and um, hoped that he would agree. And so, because when I opened up the email, I saw a picture of this little boy. And <laughs> before I read all of the, the 5,000 page document that came with his story, uh, my partner finally got back in touch with me, and he said, well, yes. I said, yes, I already said yes, so you <laughs> really, like, we'll discuss this when, when you get home. But um, the next three months was about background checks and, and making sure that we had you know, our house structured for a little boy and, and making sure that the backyard was, was perfect for a little boy and, and phone conversations with this little man that was so opinionated and said that his room had to be red and it had to be gold <laughs> and it had to have spiders. And my partner and I are very different, so I was looking for every spider I could. And my partner was like, are you crazy? He just needs a bed. And I'm like, no, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be special for my little boy. And then because it was an interstate adoption, we were in Atlanta and Zayden was in Texas. We flew to Texas. And I remember getting off the plane and we landed in Texas, my first time in Texas. And I remember we got to our hotel and we kind of talked about, you know, what the next day was going to bring because Zayden, it was too late. You had to go to bed for him to come meet us. So he had to come in the morning. So we kind of talked, the two of us, about, you know, our life as the three of us um, and tried to guess what was going to happen in the next 24 hours. So we woke up and I got a call from the caseworker and she said, we're outside. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and it was morning. I mean, it was like 8 o'clock. And what they do is they, they bring you your kid. And so I hung up the phone. I looked at Sean. I said, he's here. And so we go out in the lobby. And this much smaller boy than he is now comes up to us. He gives us a big hug. And we were totally paralyzed because we were like, well, what do we do with this? <laughs> and we went to breakfast, right? Remember? We went and we had a big breakfast, and for about two minutes, it was awkward. And I would say, because of Sean and myself, but not because of Zayden, because he was planning our day, telling us what we were going to do. And when we started talking about family, he said, oh, I know it's important in a family. And we were like, what's that? He said, where there's love. And it was never a question that there were two dads. He always wanted to know who was going to play football with him. Uh, and so as we, as we approach his gotcha day, which is May 22nd, which is the day that he came to Atlanta to um, be with us and be with his house and his dog and his two dads, I am so grateful and thankful to be here to advocate and to represent families from Atlanta uh, because I, it, remember this morning we were talking about time and you said how time goes by quickly, you know, two minutes can go by, you know, two years can seem like two minutes when you're having fun. And so it's been a year, but I, we can't imagine uh, life without our son. And our partner, my partner is in Africa right now, and um, 
we travel a lot and this little kid has been on like five, six, seven planes and he's pretty, you know, he asked me when we're coming back from Puerto Rico, when do I get my passport? <laughs> um, so to know that, you know, we were able to take a kid who was almost getting kicked out of kindergarten and to turn him into this amazing little boy that you see and for him to be the rock of our family uh, is something that I wish for everyone, right? So thank you so much. Thank well, thank you, and I'm so uh, proud to, uh, to introduce uh, uh, a person who made Florida history, made national history, but that's not the important part. The important part is that he's such a good dad, as you can see him here struggling with, uh, with Nathaniel all over the world, <laughs> all over the room. But, uh, but Martin, as I said, and his partner Bruce uh, made history in Florida and have made uh, uh, many more homes uh, available to so many uh, children who've been desperate for a stable home environment. So Martin is here with uh, one of his uh, two kids, uh, Nathaniel, and the uh, Xavier is, I guess, with, uh, with Bruce somewhere. Come on over, Martin. Okay. I want to thank Ileana for being such a great leader in this issue. Um, she was supportive along, all along the way. She was right there when we had our victory celebration at the Shore Club. And uh, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> yeah, South Beach. Um, I couldn't be happier with the, the leadership that Ileana has shown. Um, my son has never spoke publicly before, but he wrote something, and he's seen me speak a hundred times, and usually they're bored because, you know, they have to attend a lot of adult events, but he told me he wanted to speak, so he's going to read you a few words. This is Nathaniel. I am Nathaniel Gore, and I am eight years old, and I have two dads. When I was just four months old, me and my brother were placed in a foster home with my two dads. One day a social worker told me, told my dad I would get adopted quicker if they split me and my brother up. Me and my brother were in no hurry. We knew we were in our, we were already in the best home for us. And no one in my new family wanted to split us up. It took my dad five years to adopt us. My two dads are not too different from any other parents, but I think they are better. <laughs> they taught me how to ride a bike, to swim, and to play football and basketball. Adopting for me means that no matter who bad, how bad I might be some days, my dad will still love me. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. So what he was talking about there, and he's heard the story quite a few times, during, during the adoption I tried to shelter them as much as possible because it took us five years battling the state of Florida, battling the Attorney General's office, even though the Department of Children and Family had told us that uh, we were the ideal parents and that the children, it was in the best interest of the children to be adopted by us, uh, the Attorney General of the state of Florida spent upwards of a half a million dollars fighting us every step of the way. Um, luckily, we found the ACLU who backed us up and paid our legal costs. And uh, in 2010, we were victorious. We won our adoption. Um, but the story that he's talking about that he's heard so many times is that when he was about a year and a half old, almost two years old, a social worker came in and started doing little resumes on the kids. Um, and he took out two pieces of paper <laughs> and he said he had to do them separately because the older brother was now in kindergarten and that's above the adoptable age but that Nathaniel being almost two years old at the time would make a very good very would be a very adoptable young man and that he would get adopted very quickly and being foster parents, his older brother could probably stay with us. Um, my partner, who's African American, said, oh, hell no. That's not going to happen. And I said, I guess we need a lawyer. And that's what started our journey. It was 
not so much the fact that we were going to be discriminated against. It was the fact that they were going to split two young brothers up that had always been together, that had came, come together into our home, that by the time of our adoption had been with us for five years, six years at the time of our adoption. So that's what really led to our journey. Um, that's something that no foster children should have to go through. It's also something that no adoptive parents should have to go through. And the Every Child Deserves a Family Act will take care of that. It will help. If there's one thing I believe, is that every child deserves a family. I really do believe that. And I think if there's even one child out there in foster care that they can't find an adoptive parent for, I don't think we're trying hard enough. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.